said, I'm a linguist working at Södertörn University in Stockholm, Sweden. And in this presentation, I will give you an overview of the history of the Swedish gender neutral pronoun hen. Hen is a relatively new gender neutral pronoun. It became known to the general Swedish public about 11 years ago. As I said, hen is a relatively new gender neutral pronoun. And it became known to the general Swedish public about 11 years ago due to an extensive public debate. In fact, one of Sweden's most extensive language debates in modern times. And hen is used in as an alternative to the two gender specifying, specifying pronouns, hun, she, and han, he. And here you see a common illustration of the three pronouns. Han, the masculine pronoun, third person, lingula. Hun, the feminine pronoun, and in the middle, hen, the new gender neutral pronoun. In this frequently used illustration, hen is placed in the middle of a gender binary model, it would also be possible to place hen beyond this model, so outside traditional gender binaries. And my presentation is structured as follows. During the first half of the presentation, I will give you a short overview of hen's history. And during the second half, I present some of the most typical reactions to hen. But before I start talking about Swedish gender neutral pronouns, some brief information about Swedish. Swedish is a North Germanic language spoken as a first language by approximately 10 million speakers. It is an official language in Sweden and in Finland. And in Finland, around 5% of the population speaks Swedish as a first language. And hen as a pronoun is used by Swedish speakers in both Sweden and Finland. So, and now I begin with the overview of hen's history. It is not entirely clear when hen was suggested for the first time, but one of the first published texts proposing hen is a column in a daily newspaper from 1966 written by the linguist Rolf Dünos. He proposed hen inspired by the Finnish gender neutral pronoun hen. And during the following three decades, hen is occasionally mentioned by other linguists, mainly in footnotes and academic publications about the Swedish pronoun system. And when hen is mentioned, it is presented as an inclusive generic pronoun including both women and men, instead of using pair forms like hun eller han, so she or he. Non-binary intentions were not expressed and hen was not discussed as a pronoun that can be used to refer to specific persons. All these texts did not receive widespread recognition either by other linguists, the LGBTQ community or the public. In the 1990s, maybe a bit earlier, and was introduced by activists in transgender and queer communities. Some used it as a third alternative to she and he, also to name specific people who do not identify as either female or male, and others used it always as the only pronoun instead of she and he with the intention to challenge the idea of two stable, natural, and mutually exclusive gender categories. And there's no evidence that the limited discussions among linguists inspired the use of hen in these queer communities. It is possible that hen was reinvented, inspired by the Finnish gender neutral hen. And then around the year 2005, and began to be used in more widespread queer and feminist magazines and newspapers. Around that time, activists began creating blogs and Facebook pages intending to spread HEN. And in 2009, HEN was included in the online version of the National Encyclopedia 
a Swedish language encyclopedia. However, this event was not broadly recognized. Then, 11 years ago, in 2012, January 2012, and became the subject of an extensive media debate. The debate was triggered by a children's book, you see the cover here, in which the main character, a child, is referred to as Hen. And they also state that in many interviews that the aim was to write a book for children rather than for girls or for boys. And the fact that a gender neutral pronoun was used in a children's book to refer to, refer to a child prompted the media to interview preschool teachers, politicians, authors, soccer players, and others about their opinion on Hen. And for instance, the leader of the Liberal Center Party at that time, Maud Olofsson, warns in an interview that the use of Hen risks, and now I quote her, creating children who cannot feel secure in their identity because their parents do not affirm who they actually are, namely a boy or girl. End of the quote. The assumption that the use of gender neutral pronouns could harm children more than the use of gender specifying pronouns was frequently pressed, expressed in 2012. And in March 2012, preschool teachers in some districts of Stockholm were advised against using HEN in all communication with children. And in autumn 2012, one of Sweden's major daily newspapers, Dagens Nyheter, restricted the use of HEN because of the world's connection to queer political ideas. And all these events illustrate the intensity of the media debate in 2012. And due to the intensive public debate, Hen became known to nearly all Swedes in a relatively short time. In the following years, the use of Hen increased, and in 2015, it was included in the word list of the Swedish Academy. Sweden's um, main spelling dictionary. Today, in 2023, HEN seems to have lost a lot of its activist connotations and is widely used in different types of texts. And roughly categorized, HEN is today used in four different ways as a generic pronoun to anonymize the gender identity of specific persons, to refer to a specific non-binary people, and as a sole third person pronoun to challenge gender binary radically. And in the mainstream media, HEN is today mostly used in the first two ways. So to summarize, HEN lost a lot of its radical potential and is today rather used as a practical generic pronoun than as a pronoun to challenge gender binary norms. And I will now very summarizingly present some results of two studies I did on public attitudes towards HEN. The results are based on an analysis of 2,650 online comments, and these comments come from two comments sections to newspaper articles about HEN and from a thread about HEN on Flashback Forum, Sweden's most popular online forum. And the data comes both from 2012, when the public debate started, and from 2022, 10 years later. At first, I will look at how authors of public comments name and characterize the social actors that they relate to Hen. In their comments, the authors construct two distinct groups. On the one hand, they name and characterize themselves, us, 
that is those who are against him, and on the other hand, those whom they perceive as positive to him, them. Frequently used expressions to name the own group are we, the people, ordinary people, normal people, we, ordinary people, and a few more. What we see are broad generalizing terms such as people combined with adjectives that characterize those who dislike him as normal. When it comes to labeling the other group, that is people who are seen as positive to him, a lot more nominations are used. These nominations can be categorized into four partly overlapping groups. To begin with, there's a large group of nominations containing feminist, extreme feminist, the fanatic ultra-feminists, the crazy feminists, gender-confused feminists, etc. These nominations us usually consists of mm, um, the label feminist, connected to adjectives that portray feminists as extreme, crazy, or confused. And secondly, many nominations relate to gender, the gender idiots, the gender Taliban, the gender weirdos, and many more. And these nominations consist of compounds with the term gender at the first part and a noun that expresses extremeness or craziness as the second part. A third group comprises nominations relating to left-wing politics in a broader sense, like left-wing radicals, ultra-left extremists, the crazy socialists, Marxists, and many more. Even here, extremeness and craziness are emphasized. And the fourth and last group consists of broader nominations, such as moralists, polit politicians, the elite, etc. And furthermore, the authors use many transphobic terms that I do not want to reproduce here. However, um, the number of transphobic terms is higher in 2012 compared to 2022. To sum up, using the shown nomination strategies, the authors position themselves against feminism, gender studies, the political left, and queer and trans people. And there were hardly no changes over time. Now we move on to the last slide, um, for an analysis of the different types of reactions to HEN. I coded all 2,650 online comments and found five basic types of reactions. Denial, warning, downplaying, ridiculing, and personal tech. In most of the comments, several types of reactions are combined, and today I will focus on the two most frequently occurring reactions, denial and warning. Denial and warning are realized in several different ways with a number of different arguments, and the most common denying reaction is that trans people do not exist, and here you see a common Quote, there are only two biological sexes, men and women. There are no ends. This type of argument is a bit more frequent in the data from 2012, but it is even in today's comments used. One is the by far most frequent reaction, both in the data from 10 years ago and also today. And the authors are warning about different things. The following three are the most common things the authors warn about. That the underlying aim with HEN is to discriminate against cis men. The following quote is a representative example. Obviously, you must be homo, be trans, or Muslim to be accepted in today's Sweden. As a white, heterosexual man, you don't get very far. 
who portrays his men as victims of discrimination is still very frequent in today's comments. Another common strategy is to warn that Hen is introduced from above, from some kind of elite to restrict the freedom of speech. And even the argument that discuss, discussions on gender neutral pronouns are unique to Sweden and damage Sweden's image abroad are frequent. So in 2024, there are still strong reactions to Hen, but the total number of negative reactions is lower. Yep, that was a, a short overview of the Swedish gender neutral pronoun Hen's history and a very quick analysis of 2650 comments on Hen. Thank you for listening. And here I have a thank you slide. Thank you. Thank you very much. This was very interesting and informative. I've already received a few questions, but I am going to save them for the end of the second panel. So bear with us a little bit, but we I'm taking notes of the questions. Thank you so much, Daniel. Laura, we are ready for you. Thank you. Just share my slides first. There you go. So, uh, Hello, everyone. It's a pleasure to get to talk to you today about inclusive and exclusive language in Finnish. So I'll be talking about my ongoing postdoctoral research, which at this point has traveled with me among a few Finnish universities. And I'll simply start my presentation with a brief overview of gender in Finnish. So Finnish is classified as a genderless language, but this does not mean Finnish would be gender neutral, although even some Finns mistakenly believe this to be the case. Uh, what this actually means is that Finnish has no grammatical gender and gender is not marked on pronouns, but of course the usual suspects in the lexicon are still gendered. So we talk about men and women, mothers and fathers, and so on. Finnish is also no exception in that we use so-called masculine generics quite a lot. The word mies in Finnish means man and it is very productive as an epicene. For example, many sayings and even legal terms utilize man to refer to everyone as in jokamia and oikeudet or every man's rights. Man is also very common in occupational titles such as esimies meaning supervisor or palomies meaning fireman. In comparison, similar feminine epicenes are rare, although some do exist, such as Lendoim and Stewardess. Other examples of gendered language include verbs like to man, or we also talk about mother tongues and daughter companies, for example, similar to English. So uh, from the non-binary perspective, what does this mean for them? Well, non-binary speak uh, non-binary people in Finnish uh, have many of the same issues with gendered nouns uh, as English speakers do and while it may be easy to think that Finnish uh, that since Finnish does not have a pronoun problem and you can't misgender people by pronoun use uh, but on the other hand there is also no way to utilize pronouns in the same way as in English to avoid misgendering so even that isn't quite as simple in the end. Um, going back to more uh, to, to more general terms, so particularly in comparison to many English-speaking countries, discussions about inclusive language have started relatively late in Finland. Although the Institute for the Languages of Finland did provide a statement on the topic already in 2007, it took uh, 10 years before we started seeing some actual changes in language use when a uh, Finnish newspaper announced they would start using gender neutral job titles in uh, 2017. Uh, this means that language users are still quite divided on the topic. There is also very little uh, research uh, on gender exclusive or inclusive language in Finnish, which is why I decided to uh, jump in 
although I did my PhD in English studies. So uh, the main research questions uh, for my study are, do Finnish speakers use exclusive or inclusive language? Do Finnish speakers find exclusive language acceptable? And what kind of attitudes do Finnish speakers have towards exclusive and inclusive language use? And basically the idea here is to find connections between these three aspects as we know that language attitudes can at least partially explain language use and language change. So uh, for this study, I chose to uh, focus on occupational nouns because studies on English and German indicate that masculine job titles have a negative impact on female applicants, which is certainly problematic. So masculine job titles are also very common in Finnish, built with man, and there are also a few feminine job titles as well, typically ending with hostess. Um, to allow for measuring both usage and attitudes and considering different types of demographic variables, I collected my data with a survey instrument last spring, reaching part of the participants on various uh, discussion forums. I'll show you the survey design next, but I'll first mention that in order, order to avoid the social desirability effect in the first parts of the survey, the purpose of the study was not revealed to the participants prior to filling in the survey. Right, so the survey uh, included four different tasks. I'll show some examples soon, but uh, first you'll see an overview here. So I measured uh, usage with a fill in the blank task, whereas acceptability was measured both with a covert correction test and a direct question. And then attitudes were measured both with a Likert scale and with open answer questions. Uh, however, today I will focus on usage and general attitudes towards sexist and non-sexist language use. Of course, I also collected some background information, which we'll see next. So the final data here includes responses from 1146 participants, and all of them are native speakers of Finnish, but some are also bilingual, the second language typically being Swedish or English. The participants also represent different regions of Finland quite well. Most of the participants are actually cis men, a third are cis women, uh, and 7% are non-binary, and then the smallest gender group here is 4% are either trans, trans men or women. The participants had to be at least 15 years old to participate and there is a nice wide age range, although most participants are still under the age of 40. The majority of participants also had college or university level education. Uh, altogether, this is just to say that this is not a fully representative sample of all Finns, but there is nevertheless good variety among the participants. And next I'll show you some preliminary results. So the first task the participants had was a closed test, which included four test variables and 12 fillers to keep the purpose covert at this point. The task was designed so that the test variable planks would be filled in with traditionally gendered occupational titles or their gender inclusive alternatives. Two of the job titles were from stereotypically male-dominated fields, so firefighter and janitor, and one was stereotypically feminine. The last uh, job title was stereotypically neutral, the supervisor, uh, for which the conventional form in Finnish is masculine. And the results for this task look like this. So basically with the conventionally masculine based job titles, a clear majority of the participants used the masculine version and the gender inclusive titles were used relatively rarely at most by a fifth of the participants with the title for supervisor. With flight attendant, the results were a bit surprising since although most participants used the traditional feminine job title, over 30% used the male title Stuerti. Uh, which was surprising to me <laughs> since it's not, uh, I didn't think it was in common use yet. 
but in contrast, uh, feminine titles were almost never used with the traditionally masculine job titles. Mm, with flight attendant, there were also quite a few cases of using combination titles. So using both the feminine and masculine title. Uh, this also did not occur with the masculine titles. So in addition to job titles, I also measured the participants' attitudes towards uh, non-sexist language use in general. For this, uh, for this task, I measured attitudes with a 13-item uh, Likert scale, which I adapted from Parks and Robertson, modifying it to fit the Finnish context. Uh, and the scale is designed to measure three related factors, the interpretation of, of generic masculines, dismissal of sexist language and the importance of non-sexist language use, which includes uh, two items on cis-sexist language. An example uh, is shown in the red square. For this task, sexist language was de defined for the participants as language use that excludes, diminishes or discriminates against a group of people based on gender. And although the focus is broader here, many of the items specifically concern exclusive or an inclusive languages. As for the results, after averaging the score of the 13 items, we can see that most participants scored relatively low on the scale, which means that their answers indicate uh, negative attitudes towards sexist language use in general and positive attitudes towards non-sexist and inclusive language use. There was, however, quite a lot of variation, and it is, of course, this variation that is interesting, especially in terms how it connects to actual language use. Unfortunately, I haven't had the time to do a full analysis yet, but I'll share some descriptive results focusing on supervisor as regards the participants' use of job titles. So when contrasting attitudes and usage, we see a fairly clear and expected trend here as those who used a masculine job title with supervisor generally scored much higher on the attitude scale, indicating dismissive attitudes towards sexist language use. I also took a look at how different gender groups responded to the attitude scale. In short, cis male participants have the highest average score here, whereas all other gender groups have a lowest score, non-binary participants having the lowest average score. And again, a low score here indicates positive orientation towards non-sexist and inclusive language use. The last graph shows variation in usage based on participant gender. However, um, here I opted to exclude trans male and trans female participants since there were so few of them that percentages would be somewhat misleading in this case. So uh, nevertheless, what we see here is that proportionally cis male participants opted to use masculine version of supervisor the most often, but over 60% of cis female participants also also use the masculine supervisor. However, uh, non-binary participants much more often opted for the gender inclusive form. Okay, then to summarize quickly, despite commonly using masculine job titles themselves, most participants indicated generally negative attitudes towards sexist language use. This is quite interesting since masculine generics were also included in the scale, so that's certainly something to look into in more detail. I also, I also showed you how different gender groups responded to some of the tasks in the survey. Um, that cis male participants seem to support masculine language use most commonly in comparison to others is not really surprising, since masculine-based language does not di discriminate against cis men. Non-binary people, on the other hand, seem to be the most aware of the need to use inclusive language, which, again, not very surprising. <laughs> um, the last thing I want to point out is that although these results indicate that inclusive job titles are not yet very common among Finns, 
change is very much still ongoing and based on the changes that I see in my everyday life uh, and also at the institutional level at universities. I do believe the direction is towards fully adopting gender inclusive language in Finnish. Um, thank you for your attention and here are my references. Thank you very much, Laura. Thank you. There are a few questions. I'm going to start with the two questions that I got for Swedish. Daniel, there are two questions that I'm going to combine. One says, what would you say, would you say that the adoption of Han is an example of successful implementation of non-binary language in the society? And the second one is, can you explain the change in attitude towards the use of Han? Mm, yeah, I would say that what's interesting with Han is that the change went so fast. It only took like one year to get the new pronoun known to all Swedes. Um, but I don't know if I would call it a non-binary language change. That was the intention from the beginning, but now Han is more used as a practical pronoun when you name women and men as a group, or when you don't know if it is a man or women. So that the mainstream use of hen not to challenge gender binary. But hen is still used in this way in Cree and trans communities. What was the second question? The second question was, uh, can you explain the change of attitudes towards the use of hen? Mm -hmm. I think the main reason is that the media and other publications began to use hen in a non-activist way, in a practical, generic way. So I think that led to that hen got more and more accepted by the general public. I'm going to add one more question, Daniel, because I just got another one. Once adopted, where recommendations given in schools about how to use or how to introduce gender inclusive language? Mm -hmm. Yeah, in 2012, when the um, debate was so extensive, many schools uh, restricted the use of HEN, like I said, with the uh, daily newspapers, also schools restricted the use of HEN. But today, um, even the Swedish Language Council says that, uh, or writes in its recommendations that it's okay to use hen when you think about the context you're writing in. So it's not forbidden also. And it's quite common. Thank you very much for your answers. Laura, a few questions for you. The first question is, my language is gendered and super sexist. How does a Finnish language speaker view languages that are gendered? Um, that's a very interesting <laughs> question. Um, I'm probably not the most typical Finn to answer this question because I'm a linguist and I study this topic, but, um, but I do, uh, maybe one thing I could say that, um, that I, I am a native speaker of Finnish and, and as I was learning my first gendered language, uh, which was Swedish, of course, um, I, I specifically remember finding it very odd that pronouns were gendered. So that, for example, is something very difficult for, for Finnish speakers to learn is to use gendered pronouns because our brains sort of don't necessarily do gender pronouns automatically. Uh, but I'm sure there are many other things that also confuse Finnish speakers when they try to learn uh, German or other heavily heavily gendered languages. A follow-up question on that. So how is the translation done from gendered languages? Uh, with in, just in general or with pronouns? I'm going to assume that the question is about pronouns because you were speaking about Yeah, <laughs> I did my PhD in pronouns, so I always return to pronouns. Um, um, well, we only have one 
uh, third person single pronoun, so it's an easy choice. But sometimes, for example, example in literature, it may be necessary to gender the um, characters, uh, so they might switch to using gender nouns instead of the gender neutral pronoun. So it really depends. But it is quite interesting that you can read a Finnish book for a long time before you learn the gender of the character because you don't necessarily have to gender much anything. Yeah. Thank you so much, Laura and Daniel, for this very interesting and informative uh, presentation. Um, we are going to take a lunch break until 12, no, until, sorry, until 1.15. And we'll be back with a session titled Navigating the Gender, Gender Neutral Language in the Classrooms. Thank you so much for um, your presentations, Laura and Daniel. Thank you. <laughs>